All right, great. Thank you so much, Jin. I really appreciate the invitations and the uh, opportunity to speak with you about some of our um, work from the last couple of years on building synthetic cells with a reconstituted actin cell skeleton. Um, so my lab has been um, very interested in uh, this, I, you know, uh, uh, the topic of mechanical transductions of how forces are uh, sensed and transmitted by, by a single cell. Uh, in that context, um, we know that there's a lot of different forces that the cells can uh, sense, uh, and these can include uh, shear stresses, uh, strain forces, uh, extracellular uh, matrix rigidity, and that is sensed by a mechanical sensor that reside on the plasma membrane. Uh, for instance, you know, receptors, mechanical sensors, ion channels, cell cell adhesions, full cohesions, and that force is ultimately transmitted uh, through the cell skeleton uh, to uh, uh, the nucleus, which can regulate gene expression. Uh, so in this sort of um, paradigm, uh, my lab actually studies many, many different um, uh, angles of this, uh, including the ones I highlighted here, migration, cell skeleton, gene expression, uh, mechanical sensor channel, and cell cell adhesion. Uh, what I'll be talking to you about today is uh, using this sort of paradigm of mechanical transductions as a platform for building synthetic cells that has the ability to uh, sense forces, respond to forces, and generate forces. Another motivation I have is this very classic video uh, that uh, probably many of you have seen before uh, by uh, David Rogers from uh, the 1950s. Let me just uh, see, I can, there you go. So this is a neutrophil that is chasing after bacterium and pushing away uh, all these uh, red cells and ultimately um, uh, be able to uh, engulf this bacterium. As you watch this video, hopefully you can appreciate the cells is uh, undergoing very dynamic um, cell shape rearrangement uh, and, and remodeling uh, of the cell skeleton in order to achieve this very remarkable task of eating a bacterium. Uh, so based on that, you know, my, my, my lab and, you know, I have this long-term interest of uh, creating uh, synthetic cells, uh, these artificial cell-like system that can sense, respond to, and produce forces much like a cell in the body. And this uh, sort of interest of mine actually uh, started in grad school, which I'll highlight a couple uh, previous study. Um, but my lab uh, works beyond just uh, um, creating uh, artificial cell skeleton, but we're also interested in uh, creating input-output relationship that uh, you know encompasses uh, senses of forces, molecules, or light. Uh, and then they can perform different type of outputs like shape changes, enzymatic activity, or secretion. So by synthetic cell, I mean a lipid bilayer, um, you know, uh, encapsulated system that has soluble proteins and also membrane proteins on the surface that can sense the environmental stimuli. So I think of synthetic cells as a computational unit that, that performs this input-output relationship. Uh, and, and this is motivated by this idea that we have gained so much understanding of individual molecules that... Uh, uh, you know, perform basic functions in a cell, uh, and these includes individual enzymes, um, you know, cell skeleton, um, uh, protein, motor proteins, um, uh, and DNA, and, and, you know, sort of variety of things that people study. So is there a way that we can construct a biological system using these, you know, uh, molecular tools and, and individual parts? So, uh, so the goal, overarching goal of synthetic cell engineering is to assemble these biological components uh, in a meaningful way uh, that would build a synthetic cell that will mimic a certain aspect of a cell function. Uh, like I said earlier, my, my fascination in this area began when I was a graduate student in Dan Fletcher's lab at Berkeley, uh, where I developed a, a uh, system where we can uh, polymerize actin networks on the surface, external surface of a giant gilomer vesicle. And uh, during that time, I discovered uh, actin assembly can actually drive these uh, finger-like protrusions and actually uh, uh, protrude into the, into the vesicle. Um, so, you know, discover uh, several different uh, physical uh, concepts back in the days. And uh, over that course of my PhD, I began to realize, you know, reconstitution is a very powerful approach to understand cell biology. And you can, at the time, there are many, many um, um, aspects of a, of, a, of a cell function that could be reconstituted uh, and sort of illustrate them in, uh, in this uh, cartoon of a cell. Uh, so as, as, as you know, I've sort of articulated that uh, cell skeleton itself will assemble different structures and drive cell shape changes. And uh, my lab in the past few years have been trying to recreate synthetic cell with internal cell skeletons. So rather than having them on the external side of the uh, of the vesicle, but having the in, inter, you know, internal um, cell skeleton. Uh, just a little bit of brief, brief background on cell skeleton. Uh, it's um, uh, on the actin cell skeleton. It started with the actin monomers that can polymerize to linear filaments, but these filaments are decorated by a variety of um, actin binding proteins, and you can achieve different functions based on the type of proteins that are involved. So, severin proteins, cross linkers, uh, motor proteins, and bundling proteins. So, I'll be speaking about three of these uh, bundling proteins. 
that will basically uh, uh, cross-link them in parallel filaments, so they are uh, very stiff, and then cross-link for proteins that will uh, create these um, crossing network and motor protein that will generate contractions of a uh, of an actin network. Uh, two particular type of actin networks I'll talk about uh, are found in the leading edge of a cell. So here you can uh, see the the dendritic actin network that's typically found in Lemopodia, and these are branch actin networks that are generated by uh, arthritis free complex uh, branches. And then you have these philopodia, which are bundle networks that are um, uh, created by FASTEN, which is a cross linker that um, uh, creates these very, very tight bundles. Um, so, um, uh, you know, one study I'm going to highlight, uh, uh, you know, uh, involves two cross linkers. Uh, one of the cross linker is this FASTEN I just talked about. It's a six nanometer cross linker that's pretty short. It's found in the stiff actin bundle of philopodia. Uh, the other cross linker is alpha actinin, which uh, is a much larger uh, cross linker, 35 nanometer, uh, and is found in contractile ring uh, in a dividing cell. Uh, several years ago, uh, David Kovar's lab um, uh, described this idea where if you have two filaments that are cross linked by different cross linkers, uh, you can actually generate domains of cross linkers, and, and this makes sense energetically. So here uh, on this end is you have fasten that will bind cooperatively to polymerizing uh, fasten bundles, so all the fasten. Uh, cross linkers will be found here. Whereas if you uh, have um, a longer cross linker uh, at a different end, uh, it will actually promote the the, the uh, accumulations of uh, alpha actin on this end. So you essentially create this uh, segregations or domains of uh, actin cross linkers. So we thought this is interesting. Um, and in my lab at the time started to uh, reconstitute actin networks inside uh, giant vesicles, and we wanted to ask, you know, how does this actually work when you have competing cross linkers in a confined system? Uh, when you reconstitute actin network. Uh, so a lot of work I'm going to talk about today are done by uh, two uh, uh, people that um, recently left in lab. So Yasher was a, was a postdoc fellow. Uh, Nadab was a graduate student who's now uh, in David Blaze's lab uh, at Harvard as a postdoc. Um, so one of the main techniques that we use in the lab to encapsulate is this uh, technique called CDICE, Continuous Droplet Interface Crossing Encapsulation. Uh, it's a very simple technique that we first generate a single emulsion droplet just by pipetting up and down. Uh, of uh, aqueous solutions in a in an oil lipid mixture, and then we have this little device that uh, is mounted on a on a on a, um, on, a on a surplate, um, and we essentially pipette the droplets across um, an oil phase. That um, uh, at this oil water interface, there is another monolayer lipid, and as the droplet crosses the interface, it generates it creates another monolayer lipid and, and creates the lipid by their uh, vesicle. So using this technique, we can encapsulate a variety of, of solutions, including uh, purified proteins or self-free lysate, which my lab also uh, do a lot of work on. Um, so in this case, uh, here are just some examples of actin structures that are uh, encapsulated. And these are you know, ring-like structures that uh, form pretty nicely. And the advantage of this technique is it has very high encapsulation efficiency. Vesicles uh, you know, are heterogeneous in size, but also gives us the ability to look at how size effect, affect things. Uh, it's quite quick, and then we can uh, directly image them after generation. So uh, one of the early study we did is to look at uh, the effect of fasten um, actin bundle in in a, in a GUV, um, and here you can see that uh, when, when fasten bundles actin, it forms this very very stiff uh, uh, bundle, and it can protrude outside of the uh, the giant vesicle, uh, and this almost can fool people as a cell. So these are uh, bundles that basically push out of the membrane, and um, and you can actually depolymerize actin by photo almost like flow bleaching uh, the vesicles. And if you eliminate for a long enough time and the vesicle will revert back to the spherical shape uh, as you would expect and when the actin support is gone. Um, so this is interesting. And, and then the, and what we want to do next is to increase the complexity by adding uh, alpha actinin into the mixture. Uh, so so um, so when we do that uh, with alpha actin and, and, and um, uh, or so sorry, this is an alpha actin alone. So when we first just do with alpha actin and um, and we look at uh, how that structure looks as a function of GV size. Uh, we found these um, uh, ring-like structures when the vesicles are small, but as the vesicle gets larger, they seem to be more uh, disor you know, disorganized uh, and more sort of network architecture. Um, when we add alpha actin to the fasten, uh, uh, you know, to, to cross thing, um, uh, you know, uh, actin with both of these cross linkers, we we found something very interesting. Is we started to observe uh, aster structures, and you can see a few examples in here. Um, and these aster structures will have a very uh, dense uh, central domain, and then there are radiating uh, filaments uh, that radiate out of this aster. Um, so you can see a couple examples here. Um, and 
one of the things that 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 struck our mind is whether these two um, crossings were competing against one another, and whether we um, would predict that alpha actin is found in the center aster, and then the fastin is found in the uh, in the radial uh, filaments. Um, so we label all these uh, um, uh, proteins, and then uh, did a line scan analysis, and this is the alpha actin channel. And you can see very very dense alpha actin, and uh, fastin labeling wasn't so great, but we can uh, definitely make out these uh, bundles in the uh, in the peripheral uh, filaments. Uh, when we do a light scan analysis, um, this is along the, uh, the 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 center line, this line across the center, and you can see a really sharp peak uh, for the alpha actin. Uh, when we do a radial um, uh, analysis, we can see these you know uh, little peaks uh, that are fastened bundles, uh, but we don't find them in, uh, in the alpha actin channel. Uh, so this sort of confirms our idea that there is a center domain, central domain in of alpha actin with radial bundles that are coming out. Uh, we collaborated with uh, Aaron Dinner's lab at University of Chicago, and they did some uh, coarse grain stimulation for us. Um, and uh, and these are basically plotting the the uh, probable distribution functions of whether we can find alpha actin or fasten uh, in in these uh, architecture in these confined GV systems. So the top part is when we actually add just alpha actin or fasten, and you can see there's really no organized structures. If we add both alpha actin and fasten, uh, in these simulations it actually shows that they're the alpha actin would be enriched in the middle. Um, the fasten you can kind of see the it's devoided, I would say, in the in the central region. Uh, so based on that, we propose this um, uh, self organization. Uh, it's cross linker size dependent sorting uh, and confine network. And the the center again is is um, uh, is is, uh, is 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 sort of um, uh, uh, where alpha actin accumulates and fasten is in the peripheral bundles. Um, I should point out that this experiment, you know, by adding these two cross linker with actin together, if you do it in bulk. You will never see the cell organizations of an aster. We never observe that. Um, it's only when we uh, encapsulate this. Again, it, it sort of highlights the importance of confinement uh, in cell organization. Uh, so we also extended this to other type of uh, sort of cross-linker competition ideas. So here's an example where uh, fast and actin uh, can perform a lot of protrusions, as you saw earlier. Uh, if we included VCA, which is a activator for R3 complex, uh, in the lumen of the giant vesicle, it basically create branch uh, bundle network, and and that um, competition essentially suppresses the protrusion probability of these vesicles. So if you look at uh, the green bars, uh, they have very very little protrusion uh, out of these vesicles because most of the actin is kind of competing either going to branching or going to the bundles. Um, but if we attach uh, these these uh, branch network to the membrane of the of the vesicle, we can actually see these bundles will actually protrude. So this is. Um, you know, there's a difference between having a uh, network be membrane bound versus um, membrane free. Um, so the next um, little uh, quick, uh, I guess, story I want to tell is, is what happens if you include uh, myosin. So, you know, the, the premise of this is that the actin network inside of cells are active. And they often interact with membranes. So how does that um, introduce complexity in our, our system? And uh, does the binding of the actin network uh, deform uh, membrane at all? Um, and just long story short, we generate some type of phase diagram uh, by varying the concentrations of different um, cross-linker proteins and actin binding protein. And this system still includes fast and alpha actin, but we just, in addition to that, we added myosin. Uh, and then there seemed to be some type of uh, vesicle size dependent uh, architecture in here. But what I wanted to show you is, is, is a time-lapse um, uh, series that uh, was acquired with the system where we actually saw uh, some signs of blebbing. And uh, these these videos are actually very difficult to acquire. And we tried many, many GVs and ended up acquiring a few examples. But you can see um, there is the formation of some sort of actin ring that um, you know forms here. And, and over time, you can actually see uh, the vesicle is actually not very spherical. Uh, so this is one example. And then we also um, um, you know, uh, uh, develop a, a system where we really link it to the the branch network to the to the lumen, so it forms a cortex, and then at and then have the 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 myosin acting on it. And when we do that, um, you know, VCA RP three complex um, plus our, um, our our myosin, we actually see a lot of blebbing um, in, in 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 these uh, uh, in these samples. So here is one example where you can see the cortex, and these are uh, membrane label label membrane that are devoid of the cortex. Um, and here's another examples of of um, uh, of that. And there's a little bud over here that um, you know uh, is attached, uh, still attached to the to the parent GUV. And uh, again, we don't see this when we don't have myosin in there. So this is a very unique uh, phenotype. 
Um, so I wanted to, to to move on and talk a little bit about um, you know. So I've shown you different type of structures and um, but but uh, looking at these structures of uh, actin network is not just the only thing that we do in the lab, but we're also very interested in how um, these network might actually uh, give rise to different mechanical behavior. Uh, you know, in, in in this you know cell skeleton uh, GV um, uh, platform. Uh, so here are some uh, very conventional techniques that people use to measure cell mechanics, and they can be applied to GV mechanics as well. Uh, Micropipe aspiration, AFM, acoustic radiation, electro deformation, uh, and optical stretcher. Uh, my lab has uh, been using micropipe aspiration and electro deformation uh, for our GV studies. Uh, just real quick on electro deformation, uh, it's a very simple setup where we have two pieces of copper tape. We hook it up to a function generator, um, and when you apply this uh, uh, AC field, we actually deform uh, the GV very transiently, uh, and they can attain a, a ellipsoid uh, shape. And uh, to quantify this uh, shape, we simply just do the ratios of um, A over B, the, the major uh, over the minor axis. Uh, if we have encapsulate F buffer, so this is just buffer without actin in there, you can see very nice deformations of the of the GUV. Uh, if we encapsulate actin, and these are fluorescent label actin, uh, we see you know a uh, sort of more dampening of the of the shape changes. So it goes from 1.45 to about 1.23. Um, and then when we incorporated uh, the relevant uh, proteins to make a cortex, and you can see this uh, vesicle is very very uh, non deformable. Um, if we cross link this with alpha actin. Um, and this is slightly deformable, but uh, but certainly uh, more deformable than than um, uh, than the um, than the cortex case. And I wanted to mention that all these uh, conditions I've shown you have five micromolar actins. So the same concentration of actin, but different crossing by different uh, in different manner and whether to the membrane or not. So here's a su uh, summary of that crossing uh, has a higher uh, A to B ratio compared to cortex, which is really uh, very very minimal. So, uh, so we also carry out these pipe aspiration uh, experiment, and and here uh, is examples of uh, we look at two conditions: whether they're bundle, or whether they're branch bundle. So this branch bundle again is using this uh, VCA R3 complex, uh, and that's not attached to the membrane, but it creates these branch uh, bundles that are in the lumen of the uh, of the GUV. Um, so my student uh, Nadab did this interesting experiment, just aspirating them. So we wanted to know how does how do these networks uh, respond to forces, right? So a cell as they generate actin network uh, can run into different obstacle, and they will re reorganize their actin network in in response to these obstacles. Um, so we're using micropipette in a way of of inducing some type of mechanical um, stimuli to the to the GUV, and ask you know how does the network shape change. Uh, so in the top panel, you're seeing is is when we aspirate on this uh, bundle GUV, bundle actin GUV, initially you have a lot of these random or oriented uh, bundles. Uh, they collapse into a single dominant bundle that uh, as you uh, uh, aspirate, um, they kind of go together into a single uh, bundle into the pipette. Whereas if you have the branch bundle, um, these this organized network uh, are actually crossing in some way, so they do not uh, enter the the micro pipette. Um, so there's a very distinct uh, behavior between uh, filaments or bundle versus filaments or you know branch bundle. Okay, um, and that's pretty much the 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 uh, science I want to share. I'm pretty fast. I don't even need to wait for uh, Jin to give me a warning. Uh, this is probably my second last slide. Um, uh, I decided to just uh, you know have one take home message. Uh, this is toothpicks uh, uh, built into a structure. Like a truss, I guess, um, and they can support cinder blocks that are pretty, pretty heavy. Um, and as I think about the work that we do, uh, you know, I didn't really summarize the first part of it, but it's it's really about uh, how actin crossing can compete um, and and can generate very uh, different, you know, um, architecture uh, depending on confinement. Uh, but I think the second part of talk about the mechanics, um, you know, with the same type of actin concentration organized differently, you actually get very different. Uh, mechanical behavior. And I think this architecture and arrangement cell skeleton never has a direct impact on mechanical behavior is, you know, is sort of clearly illustrated here. And certainly this is something that we kind of know uh, for for um, for many years now. Okay, uh, with that, I'm going to uh, thank my lab. Um, the the people that did most of the work, I almost all the work I show you today is uh, Yashar and, and, and Adap. Um, and I also show you some collaborative work uh, with Aaron and, and Petra, uh, Aaron Dinner and Petra Shreli. Um, and Thank you so much for your uh, attention. Yeah. That's it. Let's see. So.
son muy importantes. Excuse me, Dr. Chen, you are muted. Sorry. Um, yeah, Alan, you're indeed very fast. Um, yes. <laughs> Five minutes, uh, you know, warning time. So uh, there's one uh, first question from uh, the chat uh, from uh, Dubaditya Mitra. Uh, so the question is, typically the elastic properties of GUVs are measured by various techniques, including micropipettes or AFM. These techniques give the bending modulus and the area modulus and the shear modulus is supposed to be zero because the membrane is a fluid membrane. Can the addition of the actin network generate an effective shear modulus? Have you or someone else tried to measure the shear modulus of GUVs with an actin network? Uh, well, clarification, he means uh, shear elastic modulus, not shear viscosity. Gotcha, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's a try. So, so I think the shear, I, I agree with the, the shear uh, modulus with uh, lipid being fluid, the two, I guess model layers would actually slide past one another. And there's, um, I don't know if AFM, or I guess, I don't know if AFM can measure that, but it certainly bypass ratio doesn't. But the first part about bending modulus and area modulus are actually uh, quantities that are frequently measured using bypass ratio. So, I'm, you know, there's a wealth of literature in that for GUVs. Um, so I think that first part, I, I, I'm not sure if it's the premises completely true uh for for bending modulus and 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 um an area expansion modulus those the are is, the question measured. is not about yeah. the bending modulus the it's question about, is not yeah. about the bending modulus the question is have someone tried measuring the shear modulus of guvs that have an actin network in them gotcha yeah um okay so the simple answer is i think is no but if anybody knows of, of literature that's uh out there on that um I'll be very curious to know. Uh, so, so uh, yeah, we have not done that, and I'm not sure if the people that work in this area of reconstituting actin networks and GVs have done 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 the the shear modulus um, uh, measurements um, uh, or not. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I'm not sure if that's thank the case. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Yeah. So, I see Robin unmuted uh, himself. Uh, would you like to ask a question? Robin, would you like to ask a question? Um, just a short, uh, just a remark. Um, some years ago, people added a lot of myosin to um, uh, giant vesicles with actin, and they found that the whole thing stiffened tremendously because of the forces generated, and they become tr became truly rigid. Then when they suppressed the activity of the myosin, the vesicle became very fluid and deformable. It's just a remark. Thank you. Do you know it was it done inside or was it done on the on the exterior surface? Inside. So they had inside. actin okay. inside, okay. then they added myosin yep. that produced some sort of muscle activity and a tremendous stiffening of the network. And it became quite rigid. And then when they suppressed it, it became soft again. Great. Thank you. Thanks for so uh, there's another question on the chat from Ian Wong. So what else do you need to add to the actin GUV to achieve chemotaxis? Hey, Ian, thanks for that question. This is so hard. Uh, this is my dream. I think when I started my PhD, that's what I wanted to do is to generate a migrating cell. But I realized that that's pre pretty difficult. Um, so, uh, well, I mean, you know how complex chemotaxis is. My lab also works on 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 uh, on, on living cells and um um, you know, we're also engineering receptors to try to eventually connect the cell skeleton. There are literature that have already succeeded in having GUV bind to substrates, you know, um, uh, sort of adhesion part is there. Uh, but this entire process of migration that has to coordinate protrusion, attachment, detachment, and contraction is is very difficult. We have the contraction with the protrusion, but I don't know. I mean, anybody who can do this would be, uh, would be phenomenal. It's pretty hard, yeah. But I, I would love to try. I would love to continue to work on that. Yeah. Thanks, Ian. Um, 
there's another question from Nancy Ford. Uh, so interesting work. You motivated the latter part of the talk as moving towards an input-output relation for uh, force sensing and subsequent uh, response. And you show three quite different mechanical properties of GUVs depending on the cross-linkers used for the actin. In designing synthetic cell capable of sensing and responding to its external mechanical environment, such as using focal adhesions, would one of these GUVs designed be preferred? Yeah, thank you, Nancy. It's great to see you. Um, yeah, so I, 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 my beginning talk, I talk about the sensing um, and, and responding. So, my, uh, but I didn't actually talk about the work that we do in in this particular space. Is um, uh, it uses a mechanical sensitive channel uh, that we can put on the membrane in order to sense osmotic pressure. Um, so, so we have not gone into looking at adhesion as the way to force for sensing, but um, but just in terms of membrane tension changes. So, um, uh, as you know, if you increase um, uh, osmotic pressure with hypoosmotic conditions, you stretch the membrane, and we. Um, couple this to an influx of calcium to do some very primitive signaling within the GUV. And that work hasn't been directly connected to the actin assembly yet. Um, uh, there's one person I know who's doing that type of work. It's, it's, and he's doing really well in, in that area. And, um, but it just involves you know some type of receptor engineering to figure out how to really sense force and then convert that into an intracellular signal. Um, in terms of what type of network would be yeah, it would be useful for us. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think we're, we're always trying uh, to play with all type of architecture and seeing what differences they have. Right now it's a mechanics, but maybe later on it would be some other mechanical sensing related um, responses, yeah. Okay, we can. I think we can take one more question. Uh, so this is from Bruce Edward. Uh, so very nice talk. Uh, can GUVs like this be reconstituted with intermediate filaments or other cytoskeletal and structural elements such as microtubules uh, that form interpenetrating networks with actin? If so, can these start to form more complex interactions with sub-GUV vesicles uh, such as pseudo-organelles, if this is at all possible? Thank you for that question, Bruce. Uh, this is wonderful. So. Uh... Yeah, really love the, the 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 direction. So actually, my lab is currently working on active microtubule networks at the same time, and we have some uh, interesting preliminary data uh, along that line. Um, the challenge is actually that biochemically they're somewhat less compatible uh, if you try to polymerize one in the other buffer and vice versa. But we have some pretty data on that. Uh, the interaction with organelles, I have interest in you know throwing motor proteins in there to see if we can you know uh, re re recreate some type sort of uh, trafficking events within the GUV system. But that has, you know, no one's working, working on that in my lab. Um, the first part of it with intermediate filament, uh, someone is working on that, um, not my lab, but uh, uh, my former uh, PhD student who's now a postdoc, I think he's working on intermediate filament reconstitution in GUV uh, in Dave Wace's lab. So that's, I think that's uh, work that's ongoing um, in other uh, people's um, lab, yeah. Okay, 